There are booths that allowed for private conversations. It was my chief of staff. Patrick, he said, we have a problem. Apparently, I had half woken up around 2.30 in the morning, several hours after mixing medications to get to sleep. Ambien and Fenergan, both recently prescribed, along with a lot of other asthma and mental health meds I was taking. Convinced I was late for a vote, I threw on a suit and tie, stumbled in my car, and drove headlong with lights off several blocks down 3rd Street, where I barely managed to left onto C Street. Then I barreled straight towards the security station for the House of Representatives. I swerved into oncoming traffic, nearly hitting the United States Capitol Police officer, which somehow he managed to dodge me. Maybe you turned to chase me. I slowed down, but didn't stop until my car slammed into the security barrier. Luckily, my chief of staff explained only my car was damaged because nobody was on the streets and the sidewalks where I was driving in the middle of the night. After making sure I wasn't hurt, the Capitol Police quietly took me home and moved my car to the congressional parking lot. But word spread and someone from the media had noticed the banged up car in the lot. You've got to get here, back here right now, my chief of staff said. I made a beeline to my office and barricaded myself in. The next hours were a blur of phone calls, of support, tough questions for which there were no easy answers. But the call that I remember most was from my father. The first thing he said was, I saw the picture of the car. I don't know why they're making such a big deal of this. It looked to me like it was only a little fender bender. <laughs> That's very old school. No, how are you doing? Just a little fender bender. For those not raised in New England, that's fender bender. <laughs> in fact, that's pretty much how he suggested I played it with the press and the public. I wanted him to understand that I was sick and that untreated mental illness and addiction was not about little fender benders. It was about multi-car pileups and people who were injured and killed. His insistence that this was a fender bender was the key to our issues as father and son. I worshipped my father. He was the North Star to which I navigated my life. My dad loved and supported me as best he could, but he didn't always respect me, and he didn't always understand the chronic medical condition I struggled with. He often said that all I needed was, quote, a good swift kick in the ass. Did I say any of this to him? No, I didn't. I grew up amongst people who were geniuses at not talking about things. When I was a teenager going for therapy, for my parents' divorce, I wouldn't tell my psychiatrist the truth because I wasn't sure I could trust them to keep it private. Then one day I walked into the bookstore and browsed the Kennedy section and saw all the many books that included the very family secrets that I didn't want to share with my psychiatrist. I refused to discuss, but I wouldn't talk about it. So my father was stunned when several hours later, I admitted everything that happened to the press and very publicly left for an extended rehab at the Mayo Clinic. He was also pretty concerned when I tried to demand jail time in a plea agreement so I wouldn't look like I was getting preferential treatment. And my dad was really not thrilled when after returning from rehab, I started being much more public about my private struggles with bipolar disorder and addiction. I promised myself I would have the most transparent recovery and treatment ever, all but donating my brain and its diseases to science while I was still living. I wanted to aggressively tie my personal story to the ongoing legislative fight for mental health parity, an effort to outlaw rampant discrimination in medical insurance coverage for mental illness and addiction treatment. And while winning the parity fight would be the first step to overcoming all discrimination against people with these diseases, their families, and those who treated them, I decided to go public exclusively with the New York Times. I did this with my Republican House colleague, Jim Ranstead from Minnesota. Before my crash, I had known him, although not well, as one of the only members of Congress who was openly in recovery. But after my arrest and hospitalization, he was one of the first to visit me at the Mayo Clinic. I asked if he would buy my sponsor recovery. I had never had a real sponsor before, and he invited me to his network of friends in recovery on Capitol Hill. While I thought this could have an impact, there was no way we could have predicted the resulting story would be a huge front page story in the New York Times that would run on September 19, 2006, two days 
after the death of my father's sister, Pat Kennedy Lawford, and on the day before her funeral in New York City. There was also no way to predict that the reporter would quote me talking about the veil of secrecy in my family regarding depression and substance use, and then call my dad for comment about his own drinking habits at such a sensitive time. So, of course, my dad was livid. When the family gathered after the funeral service at my Aunt Pat's house in New York, he ordered me, he called me, called the article a disaster, the word he always used to describe the most extreme situations. How dare I talk about the family this way? How dare I discuss these things in public? I stood on the verge of disintegration. I was early in my sobriety and still vulnerable. And I watched my father circulate around the room talking about the article. Then my cousin Anthony Shriver came up to tell me what his sister Maria had just done. When my dad got to her to complain about the Times story, she apparently challenged him. I think what Patrick did was fantastic, Maria said. That's what we need in our family. Someone will talk about this. And in that moment, I knew what I had to do. This issue of not talking openly about these things is hardly just a Kennedy issue. It's the problem in most American families. Most of the challenges of mental illness and addiction feel incredibly unique and private, when in fact they're remarkably common. Nearly 25% of all Americans are personally affected by mental illness and addiction every day, and one third of all US hospital stays involve these diseases and they have a huge impact on everyone else. But in this situation, there was a specific, personal, political way for me to address this on Capitol Hill. It was a bill called the Mental Health Parity Act. Um, so I tell my own story in just a brief snippet because I want to connect with those that are going to follow here. Um, and I want to thank all of those who are participating and telling their stories. The key to, to moving forward in this country is breaking the silence, plain and simple, and demanding finally that this disease be treated like any other disease. So I, I have one challenge, and that is pay for treatment for mental illness and addiction in the same way you pay for treatment for cancer. of monumental proportions. We're, we're losing so many people to suicide and overdose in this country that it is affecting the overall life expectancy of this nation at a time when medical breakthroughs are allowing people to live longer with cancer and diabetes and heart disease. Can you imagine that the life expectancy of our nation as a whole is flatlining? because of the number of people who are taking their lives and are dying of overdose in this country. It is scandalous that there is so much silence around this issue. And it starts with the silence in our own families. We can't expect our political leaders to speak out on these issues if we ourselves are not willing to talk about them. And there is a way to do more than just talk. It's called creating the NAACP for mental health and addiction. Because the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act is the civil, medical civil rights act of our time. Because it requires that no more should we treat mental health down the hall. Where you have to drink from the colored water fountain to get any treatment in this country because it's separate and unequal. That is our mental health and addiction treatment system in this country. It isn't paid for the same as any other treatment for any other disease. Why should we be surprised so many people are dying of themselves? And so the law says very simply, if you're inpatient in network or outpatient in network, or inpatient out of network, or outpatient out of network, or need pharmacy or emergency room benefits, you must get the same exact spectrum of treatment 
fermented illness and addiction, that you would receive if your illness was cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, or any other illness. Same primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of care with no more onerous medical management than you would get if you were getting treated for cancer. That means you don't have your emergency room physician spending two hours on the phone when you've got an emergency in the ER trying to get the insurance company to pay for it. That means you don't deny a patient treatment and say so you've got to go out there and almost die before you get treated. It means you don't treat this illness like you would any other illness. We don't say to diabetics, listen, we know you got diabetes, but we're not going to touch you until you are losing your sight or you need your legs amputated. That's not how we treat diabetes. Cardiovascular disease, I've been taking Lipitor for 10 years. Well, what? What's that about? Oh, because somewhere in my medical history, there's stroke in my family and heart disease, so they put me on a statin. If that's the approach for heart disease, then what's the approach for addiction? And why can't we implement what we know works in not only prevention, but treatment, and then recovery? Because these are chronic illnesses, just like a lot of other illnesses are chronic. We need a medical system that doesn't treat this in acute, episodic ways. I'm not, a, I'm not that hair club for men guy. I'm not only the author of the mental health parity law, I am a client and consumer of mental health and a patient of mental health. And I've done some research. I spent my life researching this disease. I've also researched the treatment because I've been to every treatment facility that this country has. Been to a dozen different detox and rehabs. My friends, we do not have a chronic care management system of health care, and insurance just doesn't pay for it. These are biopsychosocial illnesses, we all know that. What are the components? Bio, we need medical aspects of this disease treated. Psycho, we need mental health. And social, we need housing, supportive services, and community-based health. It's, it's a three-pronged approach. It's a physical allergy, a mental obsession, a spiritual malady, as we say, a 12-step recovery. Then let's treat what we know works. If you put all those components together in a treatment package and pay for it, guess what will reduce costs in overall health care? So I want to thank Stephanie and Rand for their work with this Clinton Health Initiative and Clinton Health Matters, because these issues need to get more attention. And the fact that they are reflecting President Clinton's interest in ensuring that there is equity, equity, and who better to fight for equity than a man who's been steeped in trying to fight for those who have been underdogs than President William Jefferson Clinton. I am so honored to be here because I think this uh, is a, a momentous time. We are going to see in the next year the most fundamental change in the approach of mental health that we've ever seen in our history. I am convinced that if we work and use this meeting as a foundation, we're going to be able to move this platform of what you decide here into a place where the next Congress and the next President, by the way, one of them has said, put forward a really comprehensive plan, the most comprehensive plan there is out there. I mean, I'll have I ever, ever, by any candidate, I won't mention, I won't mention her name, but I'll let you guess who she is. And then versus a guy who said, don't make mental health great again. <laughs> With no details. Um, but I just wanted to shamelessly say that in the back of my book, um, Vic and I, when we got to Congress, if we cared about labor issues, you just called one number, Anvil CIA. They give us overtime pay, safe working conditions, child labor, you know, OSHA standards. They give you the whole, it doesn't matter what committee in Congress you're on. There's an issue you can fight for it. It's for working people. Or you can call the Chamber of Commerce. They'll give you all the issues that 
And then if you care about the environment, you just you know, believe in conservation voters, they'll say, well, you're on this committee. You, you ought to be voting on water or air. You see what I'm saying? In mental health and addiction care, first of all, we treat them as separate, you know, too often. Suppose that it's all the brain, it's all brain health. And second, we don't outline an agenda that makes every single member of Congress responsible for something. It's not just one thing. It's a lot of things putting them together that's going to make the difference. So there's not a one-shot deal here. This is the big message here is this has got to be comprehensive, like that candidate's plan I just mentioned. It can't be just, oh, this will be the answer. We've got to do prevention, we've got to do treatment, we've got to do recovery. I'll end with this. We are creating with Morehouse School of Medicine, Dr. David Satcher, who was president uh, Clinton CDC director and Surgeon General, and the first Surgeon General ever to issue a report on mental health. David Satcher, through Morehouse School of Medicine, is launching the Parity Track, www.theparitytrack.org. The Parity Track is going to track every single state's compliance with the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which means we're going to come up with methods to give insurance commissioners the tools to evaluate whether Aetna, United, Anthem, Cigna, Humana, you name it, is following the federal law or they're not in terms of whether imposing any more onerous access or management to treatment benefits for mental health and addiction than they would if it were cancer or diabetes. Right now, we don't have that metrics. And so there's very little accountability on the part of insurance companies for paying for this. So I just want us to understand here, we can get past the personal storytelling. I'm all for telling stories. I think we got to break the shame about this. But this is a legal battle, too. We have not eradicated racism in this country, clearly. But we've outlawed anyone acting on their discrimination through the various civil rights acts that we've passed. What I'm saying is we may not overcome the stigma that we're going to talk about today. You know, in a decade or two decades or in our generation, but we can outlaw people acting on that discrimination and prejudice. And we've got to hold insurance companies accountable. And that includes the federal government. Because the biggest payer of all is Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. My proposal for mental health reform is pay a Medicare rate for all mental health services for the next five years. You will see a transformation. You know, we don't have enough psychologists, psychiatrists. We don't have enough community support systems. You pay for this illness like you would other illnesses. Watch what happens in this country. Watch what happens. Thank you very much.